Welcome to the Global Peace Film Festival Lives Online Conversation 2021 Festival Edition. Please join me, Kelly Devine, the Artistic Director, and Nina Strike, Executive Director, as we welcome Greg Mitchell, the filmmaker behind Atomic Cover-Up. This film can be seen both in our in-person screenings and as part of our online streaming festival. The in-person screenings begin September 20th and run through September 26th. The streaming portion begins September 27th and runs through October 3rd. You can get information about the schedule, ticket details through peacefilmfest.org. And now let's join with Greg. Welcome. Hello, how are you? Happy to be here. Hi, Thank Greg. Hey, great, great to be with you. Uh, so start. let's start off by telling us a little bit about the film. Okay. Well, uh, Atomic Cover-Up is the first film of the maybe dozens you know about or have even seen related to the atomic bombings and Hiroshima and the aftermath and so forth. It's the first one to really look at it uh, through the eyes of the uh, cameramen and uh, film producers and directors who shot the most important and shocking footage in the immediate aftermath of the atomic bombings in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, so the, the entire film is told through their first person accounts and also the footage that they shot. And some of this footage has never been seen before. Um, and all the footage is presented in 4K for the first time. This is a higher level of quality. Uh, so may, there may be images you've seen, but you may have never seen them like this. So, uh, so it's a unique film uh, in the, the history of the many, many um, film treatments, documentaries of the atomic bombings. So I think that's, that's like the first thing to say. Uh, the second thing is, is that the, you know, the sort of the, the other half of the movie, you might say, is the, the cover up of the title. Uh, and that is that the, both the footage, uh, black and white, shot by the Japanese newsreel team, and uh, vivid color footage shot by a U.S. military team, uh, were both, uh, came back to the U.S., and were buried, suppressed for decades. So it, it is the story of a cover-up of this uh, extremely important uh, footage in our, our history and history of the world. Um, so the, the film covers both uh, what the filmmakers, uh, the cameramen saw when they got to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, how they felt about that, what they wanted to do with those images, and, and then kind of tragically what actually happened in terms of the images, uh, the many thousands of feet of footage that was seized by the US, buried, suppressed, and uh, no one could see it or get at it for, for many decades. Um, and so that's sort of the, uh, sort of the big picture of this, uh, of this uh, film. Uh, and it ends with um, really focusing on one of the two American uh, former military officers who helped shoot the footage and then was the one who uh, made the greatest efforts to get it seen. And we do get a sense of what drove him. And uh, he was very involved with the anti-nuclear movement as, as I was in the 1980s. And what, why this footage is important today. Why is it relevant? Why should anyone care about this, you know, 76 years later? Well, you mentioned your involvement with the anti-nuclear movement in the 80s. Is that when you learned about this particular, you know, story? No. Yeah. yeah, in 1982, I was hired as the editor of uh, the Bible of the anti-nuclear movement, which was massive at that time. The Freeze Campaign and all the other groups that were involved uh, called Nuclear Times. And uh, I was the editor for four, I think, four years or so. And during that time, of course, I got, you know, I was exposed to things about the atomic bombings, but there was so much uh, at the time going on about the current uh, nuclear threats um, that, you know, Hiroshima, of course, of course got, got plenty of mention, but it wasn't until I got a journalism grant to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki for a month in 1984, which was very unusual. Most reporters then and now, uh, you know, jet in and jet out or, 
they come for two days and they're gone. Um, but, uh, you know, I was there for, there for a full month. And so, uh, and I interviewed everything, everyone from survivors to American military to physicians and physicists and everyone else. Um, so I did come back with more knowledge and more interest in, uh, in the subject. And uh, I just started writing about it, uh, wrote uh, articles for not only Nuclear Times, but the Washington Post, the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wrote hundreds of articles after that. I did a book in 1995 with Robert J. Lifton, uh, one of the great uh, writers on this subject for, for decades. Uh, we did a book called Hiroshima in America that got quite a bit of attention. Um, and I wrote a book as recently as last year called The Beginning or the End, which is about how um, Truman and the military uh, kind of destroyed the first Hollywood movie about the subject uh, that MGM made. Uh, and the scientists were trying to get this word out that this was a, uh, we should take a look at nuclear weapons. We should take a look at the decision to drop the bomb. And Truman and the military then gutted it. Um, and so there's, my book is about that. Um, but sort of in between that, I wrote a book about the, uh, it's called Atomic Cover-Up, um, about the same subject. And then uh, in the last uh, year or so, I have been able to get at this footage and sort of fulfilled a dream of almost 40 years of making a documentary about this. And so basically, after 40 years, I finally have uh, created this film. Um, very much along the lines I always wanted to. Um, I think it's kind of subtle. I think it's sort of haunting. It's not typical polemic or anything like that. I think it's kind of more artful. And um, so I think it turned out well. And uh, I'm happy that, uh, you know, people around the world have, have a chance to see it, uh, see it now. Oh, uh, I agree. Uh, I was really taken by your film and really urge uh, anyone out there watching this to, to check out the film. Um, 40 years, that's a, <laughs> amazingly, you know, uh, it's an amazing commitment to, uh, you know, a particular time in history and to the story. What I, what I left out briefly was that the first feature, I, when I, even before I came to Nuclear Times, I was uh, learned about the this footage, which was sort of un, totally unknown at the time. I met the, uh, the American who uh, helped get it released and is sort of the, the most featured person in my film uh, back in 1982. And so when I became the editor of Nuclear Times, the first feature uh, that I assigned and helped, helped work on was, an inter was a profile of him and this whole story. And that, um, really was the first story that brought this to the attention of the of Americans. Um, so that was in like January of 1983. And so ever since then, I stuck with the story. And, uh, um, and, and so this really is does go back that far to my very early uh, interest in this. Well, as you were digging into the story over, as you mentioned, decades, um, what were the things that 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 surprised you or that challenged even some of your, uh, uh, you know, your initial frames for looking into the issue? Well, I mean, part of it was that the, there's a kind of a, I don't want to say it's a dichotomy, um, but there's both the Japanese aspect of it with their elite newsreel team, uh, black and white footage, uh, and then the Americans, you know, occupiers, uh, you know, elite military a team, color footage, the latest thing, high, you know, high quality color footage. And um, I used to think they were sort of two separate things, two separate issues. The black and white footage first surfaced around 1970 um, and the color footage then first surfaced in the early 1980s. They didn't come out at the same time. Uh, people became aware of them at different times. But, you know, as I found it, and I researched the story, and I, I have a lot of uh, formally classified documents and uh, records of all sorts, hundreds of pages of that, um, is that actually the, the American, the, the same uh, man who directed the American uh, shooting, not, not the, the fellow I mentioned earlier, who's kind of the star of the film, another man also was a man who handled the Japanese footage after it was seized. So the same office in Tokyo uh, was involved in both the Japanese black and white footage and the, the American color footage. 
Uh, it was then brought, they were brought back to the US about the same time and they both suffered the same fate, but very much tied together. So it really became in a way one story. And, uh, you know, I was very happy in this film as you will see um, to have so much for the first time in America, uh, the, the Japanese uh, uh, film people describe their experience. I, I, you know, I had memoirs translated and uh, got their words for the first time. Uh, and, uh, and so you see in the film, like I said, it starts right after the, the first images of the aftermath goes through the first few weeks, the first few months, um, switches back and forth from black and white to color. <laughs> Uh, and then it eventually ends up back in the U.S. with the uh, Herbert Susson, who was one of the, the two American soldiers, uh, making his, his incredible effort for decades to get the film released. So the, the focus then shifts to him for the final third of the, the film. So, um, but it really tells one story. And, you know, what has driven me and what I hope people come away from is the urgency still of nuclear threat today. You, again, I mentioned earlier, you know, people will tend to say, well, this is all you know, terrible or, or, or even we shouldn't have done it or whatever their view may be. But you know, what's, what does it matter today? You know, we can't undo it, um, 200,000 dead. You know, we can't do anything about it. Um, and, and besides, there's so many other issues today to be concerned about, uh, including climate change, for example. But you know, as we sort of make clear at the end of the film, is that nuclear threat is actually kind of hidden uh, at, a, at some would say the highest point in, in history. Certainly the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists um, last year it kind of shocked many people by moving their famous doomsday clock hands closer to midnight than they'd ever been. You, know, you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, you think about the 1950s, you think about the arms race and, and all that, but yet uh, they move those hands uh, 80 seconds to midnight, I think it is. And that's because there are so many different, we can't, don't have time to go into them, but there's so many nuclear powers today, so many various threats and dangers that this is a very live issue. And the, the problem what it, that has driven me since the 1980s is that, um, you know, the US still by and large are Americans, uh, citizens uh, in opinion polls, uh, certainly politicians, officials, military people, US presidents uh, have all supported or in, in the main supported the use of the bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, even uh, President Obama, who I at least went to, became the first president to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki while in office, uh, never said anything about the, uh, whether the bomb should have been used then. So, um, and today we still have a nuclear first use or first strike policy, which we initiated on August 6, 1945. Most Americans, I don't think, know that, or if they know that, they don't quite know what it means, but you know, it means the US reserves the right to strike first with nuclear weapons, not in response to an attack, but it could be a threat from abroad. It could be a conventional war that you know, starts to get out of hand. It could be a, 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 a nut in the White House. I won't mention any names, but uh, someone who might have uh, you know, ordered an attack for almost uh, no reason. Uh, we still have that policy totally in place. And, uh, you know, the problem is that we have built into our culture and media the notion that uh, we don't want to use nuclear weapons again, but when we use, we use them twice already, and that was actually a good thing, uh, or it's defensible, it's a defensible thing. Um, so as long as we're making exceptions 76 years ago, you, one can imagine easily making exceptions today. So. I think it's important for new generations, younger generations and others to not only, uh, you know, in a way come face to face with what happened in 1945, um, but also ponder um, the acceptance of that, what that has meant to our policies, what it means to us today, what, how dangerous that is to be in the minds of leaders that, uh, well, you know, it's, it's regrettable or it's, terrible thing. I, you've probably yourself both heard, you know, heard the phrase, you know, uh, well, we must, we must never use nuclear weapons again from the same people who are 
running nuclear policy and have a first use policy in place. So, and, and who accept the use of the bomb in 1945. So I hope the film in, in showing, like I said, I hope in a rather artful, subtle way, um, what happened then, what happened in the aftermath and, and why there was a need to cover it up, that that conveys just through film, just through images and, and a few words, um, the importance of their relevance today without you know beating you over the head or you know saying sit, sit here for this lecture it's it's quite the opposite of that um agreed one of the things that really attracted me as a programmer to the film is um is this intergenerational conversation about why that issue uh that happened so many years ago is still vitally important today right. and i think the film does a great job of making that connection and when you talk about our current first use policy, that leads me to think about um, the purpose mm -hmm. for the Global Peace Film Festival, which is to bring people models of peace, uh, to challenge ideas, to give them new frames of reference, to think about the existential challenges and, and even their own kind of personal issues so that they can make positive change in the world because we, we do try to work towards uh, a just and more peaceful world. And we're trying to give people also opportunities to act in terms of, of um, you know, those actions being connected to particular issues and policies. And that, could you talk uh, a little bit about that first use policy and, and what kind of role anyone watching the film what that person could take away. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think I've outlined the, you know, the, the, the dangers of it and, and the fact that, you know, President Biden came into office and he's, he was on record previously as expressing some questions about whether that should be maintained. I haven't heard much about that. Or I haven't heard anything about that for a while. Uh, there are uh, always, and I think today, uh, there are, there's legislation or there, there, there are bills or there are, proposals in Congress uh, to, uh, to take away the first use policy. There's organizations in Washington. It's definitely on the agenda, but it's a tough, you know, it's a tough fight. And, you know, generationally, uh, one can understand the, the focus on climate change. Um, and, um, you know, in, in the past, um, you know, young people were among the leaders of anti-nuclear, you know, protests and, uh, a focus on that because the, you know, the thing was, well, this is our future uh, or this is the future of our kids or, you know, we're trying to save the planet. And, you know, there are so many environmental issues connected to nuclear, including nuclear waste and, uh, and all that. Uh, so uh, now that's been supplanted, kind of the same things that people say about climate change. You know, it's for us, it's for our children, it's for the future, save the planet. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's great. But I think the, you know, the, what can get forgotten is that climate change does take, you know, it's going to take time to get, get, get worse. There are years or at least a few years where we still could do something about it, where, you know, nuclear war could happen anytime or an accidental war, you know, that, that's why so much of the focus has been on to get weapons off high alert. One reason they're on high alert is because we may want to launch a strike anytime. Uh, and so get rid of nuclear weapons, get them off alert and so forth, because, you know, while we're debating all these other important issues, you know, next week we could have a crisis or just out of the blue, a nuclear strike somewhere. And that's not incremental, that's uh, overnight. So um, I'm one of those people that keeps focusing on that. Other people have other issues to focus on, but I, you know, so I, I guess I urge people who are interested in this, uh, of course, to watch the film, but uh, also um, then check out the various uh, the groups and organizations that are still focused partly or mainly on uh, nuclear threat. So, uh, what are what are your next steps? Uh, where where are you going next with this work? And um, and how? And you've actually already said how what audiences can what our audiences can do about it but um, how can our audiences support your work? Well, I, I think, um, you know, we'll see the film just as uh, first uh, came out or premiered last spring. So it's really only been around for a few months. 
it's been in a few festivals, it's going to be in a few more festivals, it's not yet on a streaming service, service except in Europe. I mean, I guess maybe unsurprisingly, <laughs> there's been a lot of interest in this film elsewhere in the world, but uh, in the US, we're still building it. But it's, it's getting, getting a fantastic reception, uh, you know, the reviews and the, the comments and the quotes and just it's been in sort of an overwhelmingly uh, positive uh, reception and uh, all sorts of leading uh, media outlets and figures have endorsed the film and so forth. So uh, it's still building. Um, and like I said, it's in other festivals coming up. So I guess if people want to check in, uh, it, it's not available, you know, to, for someone uh, like today, find it online. Uh, but uh, watch it through your festival. Uh, keep an eye. Go go to my website and see what what else can be done in the future. Or uh, maybe recommend uh, local groups or national groups. Uh, screen it, stream it. I've done a, done a couple of those with uh, peace groups that have uh, you know kind of streamed the film for one night. Um, so. Um, you know, if you like the film, you think it's important, certainly you can um, ask me or you can ask um, other groups or your local PBS station, for example, or whoever, but you must show this film. Um, and, you know, that would certainly, uh, certainly help out. Great, Greg. We will definitely urge our Global Peace Film Festival community to check out your website, which is gregmitchphoto.com slash atomic hyphen cover hyphen up slash. Again, that's gregmitchphoto.com slash atomic hyphen cover hyphen up slash. Please do go to his website and follow um, the progress of this film. And I think that is a great suggestion, Greg, for people to reach out to you to schedule their own screenings. And again, please check out peacefilmfest.org for all of the updates regarding the 2021 program, the in-person screening starting September 20th, running through the 26th, and the virtual streaming portion of the festival starting September 27th, running through October 3rd. Follow us on social media and consider joining our mailing list. And we will see you on the next GLOW. Thank you.